Uh, greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute uh, to this um, continuation of our series on reason and wisdom in medieval Christian thought. My name is Michael Le Chevalier. I'm associate director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, and I'm always excited to welcome you here because this is an opportunity for you as viewers across the nation to get a taste for the type of programming that we're offering every week for students at the University of Chicago. Um, I want to thank the many Catholic institutes like ours who are helping to extend the reach of our programs by co-sponsoring with us. Now, some of you tuned in on Tuesday for our conversation with Bernard Begin and Wilhelmine Otten on apocalypticism in times of crisis. If you didn't tune in for that, you can find that video and others at our website or at our YouTube page. I would also like to call your attention to the fact that McGinn will be joining us again next week um, as a part of this web lecture series, um, at, at which time he'll be presenting on Meister Eckhart. Um, it's really not something to be missed. I'd also like to call your attention um, to an upcoming event on June 9th that we will be hosting with Jen Frey, Russell Hittinger, and Father Michael Sherwin. We'll be hosting them for a conversation on Christians in times of catastrophe. Augustine City of God. Now, if you prefer your Catholic intellectual tradition on the go, you can download many of our great lectures from the past as podcasts, whether it be Jean-Luc Marion on Christian philosophy or Regina Schwartz on retribution and forgiveness. You can just go to our website and look for those buttons at the top to click either on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, etc. If you want to support our work helping to bring the Christian intellectual tradition to the university and to our broader culture, you can donate at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. You can also become a partner of ours by simply helping to share word about our events by posting things on social media or sharing our emails onwards. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Rob, who helped organize this series, to introduce and welcome back to the University of Chicago, Kevin Hughes. Rob? Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you again for coming in to join us for this series on reason and wisdom and medieval Christian thought. This course uh, it offers a lot of presentations by high class, uh, first class scholars on the great thinkers of medieval Christian tradition, especially looking at the theme of the tension arising between the contemplative and the more dialectical or rational ways of seeking the face of God. This is our anti-penultimate uh, session, second to last, uh, number seven in our series of nine. We have two more to go, as Michael said. Uh, Professor Bernard McGinn will come to speak to us on Meister Eckhart, a real treat, next time. And then after that, Professor David Albertson will be speaking to us about Nicholas of Cusa, a lesser known but very valuable speaker, uh, thinker and speaker. At any time during the presentation, uh, you can ask a question using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we get a lot of great questions and then at the end of the presentation, we'll do our best to ask as many questions as we can. Let me now introduce our, our speaker, Professor Kevin Hughes. Professor Hughes teaches at Villanova University. He teaches uh, historical theology, specializing in medieval and early modern Christian thought. In recent years, he's held the, uh, a variety of positions at the university, including the chair of the theology department, chair of the humanities department, and each October, he directs the Patristic Medieval and Renaissance Conference. Professor Hughes, when he was doing his doctoral work in Chicago, was part of the milieu out of which Lumen Christi was formed and was part of its earliest programming. So we at Lumen Christi are delighted to, to have Professor Kevin Hughes do a presentation for us again tonight. Uh, Professor, can I invite you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera? Wonderful. Well, great to have you. Thank you so much for uh, for having me here. I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, of this event, and uh, delighted to be here with you all. Uh, I've been a listener, a participant in the, in several of these um, uh, seminars already, and I really just uh, benefited from them quite a lot. So it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here and to be at least virtually uh, back uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm gonna be working with uh, some slides. So I'm going to uh, pull those up now and uh, you'll still see me. Um, let me just get this going. Um, so I am here to talk to you tonight about uh, someone who is very near and dear to me. 
um, uh, St. Bonaventure. And I want to talk about Bonaventure between Paris and Assisi. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. But let me just say that, that I've been working on St. Bonaventure for, um, for about 20 years now. And uh, I never cease to be amazed at his capacity to sort of bring uh, the disparate elements of the Christian tradition, thinking about reason and wisdom and just the way that this series uh, intends to, uh, to bring these, these disparate elements together into a rich and powerful synthesis. And I'll be speaking a little bit about that uh, tonight. So without further ado, let me say a little bit about who Bonaventure is. Uh, Bonaventure was born Giovanni di Fidanza. Uh, he was born in 1217. Some people say 1221, but we think it's more likely 1217. He was born in Bagno Regio. This is that great image of uh, the Civita, the Bagno Regio you see there. It's in the region of Viterbo. Um, it was part of the Papal States at the time. And uh, the great Bonaventure scholar Zachary Hayes, sort of looking at seeing this uh, hometown of Bonaventure, uh, just sort of entertained a thought experiment, often entertained a thought experiment that wonder if the geography of this place had an influence on forming Bonaventure's uh, imagination as a young person. Because the image, the, the sort of symbolism of center and circumference of uh, becomes so important to Bonaventure and it's such a striking image. Um, because God is eternal and most present, he embraces and enters into all things that endure in time as both their center and the circumference. And you'll recognize, some of you will recognize this quote, God is an intelligible sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. He is within all things, but not contained by them, outside all things, but not excluded, above all things, but not distant, below all things, but not dependent. This great, great quote. And it, who knows what, whether, uh, whether the space itself of Bagno Regio had an influence on him in that way, but, uh, but it's interesting to, to speculate how our imaginations are formed. What do we know then about, uh, about how uh, Bonaventure gets to be where he goes? Uh, he was, by about 1235, we know that Bonaventure, young Giovanni, is uh, at the University of Paris. He's a young and promising student. He goes through the usual curriculum. He studies uh, uh, in the School of Arts first with the Faculty of Arts and uh, is a Bachelor of Arts before he then enters into the Faculty of Theology. And, uh, and he studies under some very notable masters, Odo of Rigaud, Jean of La Rochelle, uh, William Middleton, and most importantly, Alexander of Hales. Uh, later in Bonaventure's writing, he will uh, refer to our beloved Alexander. So Alexander really becomes a kind of father figure for Alexander, uh, for, for, for young uh, Giovanni. And so um, in 1243, under the tutelage of Alexander, uh, Giovanni di Fidanza becomes Bonaventura, brother Bonaventura, um, and becomes a Franciscan. Now, all the details of all the influence and all the, you know, uh, who had influence on his thought, that, that's all a really interesting and rich area of research that's going on right now. Um, but what's important for our purposes tonight is that I want to emphasize that Bonaventure became a Franciscan in and through his life in Paris and in the university. And the reason why I think that's important is that uh, for the great founder of the Franciscan community, for Francis of Assisi, it was not always clear that the life of learning, the life of the university, was the best place for friars to be, for his brothers to be. Um, Francis, as you will know, uh, really uh, abandoned everything. He abandoned all his wealth and all his status. Uh, he embraced lepers. Uh, Francis envisioned his ministry, I think, as, uh, as mendicant, as really wandering beggars, preaching the gospel, um, begging for their food or doing manual labor. That was his initial vision of what, uh, what, a, what a friar should be. And uh, it wasn't clear at all that, that, uh, that studying, that having books was going to be a part of it. He preferred the kind of simplicity of this, this, uh, this vision that we have of you know, Francis preaching to birds, but he preached to other people too. However, what happens? Well, in a sense, the Franciscans are a victim of their success. This is this great image from the, bottom, from the, the Francis cycle of uh, Pope Innocent having a dream of a, of a poor man in a, in a cloak, uh, sort of lifting up the church and sort of saving the church in this way. And this is his image uh, that precedes his meeting of Francis. Um, 
it's very clear because of their success, because of the great um, enthusiasm, the great um, attractiveness of this evangelical lifestyle that, that uh, Francis embodies and his followers embody, the Franciscans are, are drawn upon, they're, they're called upon for a great pastoral mission. And when you have that kind of pastoral responsibility, well, new skills are needed. You can't just sort of be a, a beggar and a wandering preacher. You need an education. And so it's so really pretty early on, uh, there's this tension within that from between the original vision that Bonaventure had and the, the, the exigencies of, a, of their pastoral responsibility. So there's a tension there that Francis really didn't really finally resolve until St. Anthony of Padua, who had been an Augustinian, I'm not supposed to admit this, going to an Augustinian institution like Villanova, but uh, he had been an Augustinian. And then he heard about the martyrdom of some of the early followers of Francis and he became a Franciscan. And, uh, and so he asked uh, Francis if he could begin to teach the friars theology. And so we have this great letter, this short letter um, from, from Francis to, uh, to Anthony. Brother Francis sends greetings to Brother Anthony, my bishop, he always called him my bishop. Uh, I'm pleased that you teach sacred theology to the brothers providing that, and this is important. As is contained in the rule, you do not extinguish the spirit of, uh, of piety and devotion during the study of this kind. So Francis said, okay, all right, it's okay to study theology, you should teach them theology, but if it extinguishes the spirit of uh, piety and devotion, then, then it's working against the vision and we can't have that. So Francis always has this sort of caveat. There's a great story about Francis. Francis wasn't even sure he wanted people to own books. There's a story about uh, Francis that's preserved in the, uh, the Legend of the Three Companions um, where Francis, uh, a brother comes to him and asks him, he's a, he's a brother who can read, and he asks if he can have a psalter to, uh, to assist in his prayers. And uh, there's some hemming and hawing, some going back and forth, and Francis finally says, brother, if you have a psalter, next you will want a breviary. And if you have a breviary, next you will sit in your chair and, like a bishop, say to your brother, bring me my breviary, right? And so he refuses this because the whole idea of even having a book Francis is worried that it conveys a sense of sort of eminence and power that is antithetical to the vision that he has. And he's, he sees that all wrapped up in this life of study, uh, or at least as a, as a threat if the friars embrace this life of study. That's a controversial topic within the order. Um, it's certainly not the universal uh, opinion of all the friars. People like Bonaventure is not unique in coming to his Franciscanism through the university. There are a lot of friars who are in uh, studies, um, but there is this sort of constant tension within the community of the Franciscan uh, brothers that uh, the, there's a contingent of folks who are really worried that, that Paris, Paris being the sort of representative symbol of, uh, of this uh, educational authority, um, Paris will kill Assisi, Jacopone de Todi, cursed be Paris that has killed my Assisi. So there's Bonaventure. Bonaventure is sort of in the midst of that. How does he uh, respond to that tension? And I, what I wanna say, first of all tonight is that that tension I think is a living reality in Bonaventure's thought. Even though he's a man of Paris, even though he, he's, uh, he, he writes a lot of books, um, Bonaventure is constantly sort of aware of this tension and he's constantly uh, thinking about the, the caveat that Francis had given, lest it extinguish the spirit of piety and devotion, right? Uh, the fire of devotion there. He's really concerned uh, to make sure that whatever we do with our studies, and it turns out he thinks we can do quite a lot, whatever we do with that life of study, that it not extinguish the fire of devotion, right? That's, that's the key, key question here. Because for, for Bonaventure, the key thing about the Franciscan community is that it has it all. It has the simplicity of Francis. But here's this great quote from uh, his letter to an unknown master. He says, I confess before God. This is the most autobiographical statement I think we ever get from Bonaventure. He says, I confess before God that this is what has made me love the way of life of St. Francis, that it is like both the beginning and the perfection of the church. 
which first started from fishermen and afterwards advanced to the most renowned and skillful doctors. So Bonaventure's vision of the Franciscans is that they are like, they are the whole church and the whole history of the church in microcosm. They have the simplicity of the first, you know, of the fishermen, uh, of Peter the fisherman, but they also carry forward the, the great erudition of the most renowned and skillful doctors. That's the package that he wants to hold on to. And I think that's the package that he's gonna argue for even as he begins to be worried later in life. This is coming attractions for the end of the talk. But he comes to be worried later in life about uh, some threats to, uh, to the spirit of uh, fi the, the fire of devotion um, in the university community. Okay. But as I said, Bonaventure remains a man of Paris. Uh, he goes through his career. He's ready to incept in Paris at 1254. Um, there's a huge controversy about whether mendicants can, can, be, on, uh, can be incepted into the faculty at that point. Uh, and so he and Thomas Aquinas are sort of, uh, it's like the worst case of ABD uh, syndrome that you ever have. They're all ready to go. In fact, they're all graduated officially, but they can't be incepted into, as a master. They can't be sort of brought on to the faculty until uh, really it's a papal order that, that uh, comes to the university saying you must incept these folks. And that finally happens in 1256. Uh, and sure enough, soon thereafter, 1257, Bonaventure is elected minister general of the Franciscans. And so his tenure as a, a sort of official master within the university is actually rather small, even though, bear in mind, he's been around the university in one way or another for 22 years or thereabouts. So he's, he's very much a man of Paris and he remains in Paris. Paris remains his home base, even as he really does uh, walk to see all of the various provinces that he can reach. Um, so he goes on foot and travels. So there's a kind of itinerant uh, life once he becomes minister general, but when he comes home, he comes home to Paris. And you see this image here of Saint Chapelle on the Ile de la Cité. Um, this this beautiful, beautiful uh, chapel. If you haven't been there, everybody should go at some point in your life. Um, but this, but we know you know uh, King Louis the Ninth uh, had this chapel built, and we know the Bonaventure preached here. So I had one. Uh, I was able to visit Saint Chapelle. I was standing in the place trying to figure out where was it that Bonaventure must have stood um, in, this, in this great, uh, beautiful place. Um, he writes a lot of books um, and many of those are sort of in the scholastic mode. He writes scriptural commentaries as all students of his generation uh, at uh, the university did. We have a, a commentary on Luke that he wrote initially and then continued to revise throughout his life. Uh, we have a commentary on John. We have a commentary on Ecclesiastes. Bonaventure uh, delivers a commentary on Peter Lombard's Four Books of Sentences, and that becomes a very influential sort of, um, not cliff notes, but sort of foundation for other books of sentences. So we think that, for example, when Thomas Aquinas comes along a few years behind uh, Bonaventure, we think that, that he's got uh, Bonaventure's book of sentences, book of commentary on the book of sentences in front of him as he's delivering his, uh, his commentary itself, which becomes the scriptum of Thomas Aquinas. He's got a short book that is as close as we come to a sort of full on systematic theology called the Breviloquium, as the title might suggest. The most famous work, the Itinerarium Mentis and Deum, or the mind's journey, sometimes the soul's journey into God. Um, that becomes, if you've read anything by Bonaventure and that the one thing you've read by Bonaventure, it's probably that. Uh, but he also writes uh, The Major Life. The, the order com, uh, commissions him to write an official life of Francis and, uh, and the Legenda Maior is his, uh, his achievement there. Um, and then at the end of his life, as Minister General still, um, he delivers three sets of lectures in the late 1260s and early 1270s. Um, three sets of lectures uh, to the friars who are studying theology uh, and masters uh, in the university. Um, and they have some critical things to say. I'll say more about that later. But the Galatians on the Ten Commandments, the Seven Gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the Six Days of Creation. And I'm going to focus specifically on the last work, on the Six Days of Creation, when we get near the end of our, uh, of our time, at least my part of our time together. Um, there are many other writings, but these are sort of the major, uh, more substantial pieces and the things that, uh, that, that tend to sort of be passed around in quite a lot of manuscripts. There are a few others that are quite popular too, um, but these are the ones that you may see.
Now, how does that man of Paris, how does that Parisian uh, theological erudition match up with that life and spirituality and piety of Francis of Assisi? Let me start by sort of thing, saying that I think we can get a clue to it when we take a look at this beautiful uh, piece of, uh, famous piece of Francis's writing, the Canticle of the Creatures, or sometimes called the Canticle of Brother's Son. And I don't wanna take the time to sort of read through the whole thing. But what we have here is the development of a, of, uh, a kind of, of fraternal uh, ordering of all of created being, brother sun, sister moon, brothers wind and air, et cetera. Um, and they are all sort of joined in praise. Now I've highlighted this word through, which in the Umbrian of the original uh, 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 text here is pair like in Latin or in later Italian, right? Um, through all that you have made, but it also stands in as by. And, and so, so all of this praise is sort of the, the, the one hymn of praise that is coursing through all created being. So that's the through, right? The kind of unity of praise that all of creation is singing. And yet by, there's a kind of fraternal participation of each and every particular being, of each and every particular even condition or occasion uh, to, to share in this life of praise. Um, if you look at the, the second part of the poem here, it even extends to the whole earth, but then these sort of human activities, right? Praise through those who grant pardon, through those who endure sickness and trial, and again, in a similar way, by those who grant pardon, by those who endure sickness and trial, and even by death. So this grand sort of cosmological vision of uh, fraternal participation and praise that is at the very heart of Francis's um, vision of creation, of, of, of existence itself. How does Bonaventure take that and uh, integrate it? Here's the sort of this is an image of a manuscript from Divine Comedy. You know, Bonaventure makes a sort of star turn in the Paradiso, in Dante's Paradiso, where he says, the love that makes me beautiful bids me praise. And so you almost get a sense that Bonaventure is joining in that hymn of the Canticle of the Creatures. So how does Bonaventure integrate that Franciscan vision into the life of uh, the theological work that he does? This is gonna be a very simplistic way of talking about it. It's just too simple. There are a lot, of, you know, my friends out there who are listening, if you're Bonaventure scholars with me, I just, I'm sorry. I know there, I, you know, we could put a lot of footnotes in here. But, for, but one way of thinking about Bonaventure's accomplishment here is that he's taking sort of great theolog theological sources or great theological figures and able to sort of bring them together and integrate them. And I wanna focus in particular now on uh, the way he brings together Augustine and Pseudo-Dionysius, two of his most important sources, I think. So from St. Augustine, we, you know, we have the sort of vision of St. Augustine uh, from the confessions. We have, late have I loved you, beauty ever ancient, ever new. You have made us for yourself in, in confessions one. The entire life of a good Christian is a holy longing from those homilies on the first John and uh, uh, love God and do what you will. So this vision of love in Augustine lays claim to sort of the personal and, uh, and the interior dimensions of God's love uh, for us and of our love for God in return. So this existential um, personal sense of, uh, of the movement of love here. So he takes a lot of other things from Augustine, but think about that, that sort of that vision of the soul God and the soul and nothing else, as Augustine says. Now, he complements that with this work from uh, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, this early Christian source who, you know, we don't know exactly who it is, but uh, um, uh, really influential, especially in the 12th and 13th century on the, on the pre-scholastic and scholastic uh, theologians, um, where Eros is, is a name of God, that God is, a, is the sort of movement of Eros itself, of the movement of desire itself. And we could almost describe what we see in, in, uh, in, in Pseudo Dionysius as a kind of metaphysics of desire. This great quote from the divine names, right? The very cause of the universe and the beautiful superabundance of his good uh, Eros uh, is all carried outside of himself and the love and care he has for everything. 
He is, as it were, beguiled by goodness, by love, and by eros, is enticed away from his transcendent dwelling place, and comes to abide within things by virtue of his ecstatic capacity, still with rain, remain still within himself. So this vision of sort of divine eros pouring forth um, in God sort of being beguiled to sort of be ecstatic, to step outside of God's self while still remaining in himself. That, that's sort of what creation is. Uh, existence is the sort of pouring forth of divine eros. Right, that's from divine names. So from Sutra Dionysius, Bonaventure gets this notion of a kind of cosmic desire, which he thinks of as God's frontal fullness, this frontalis plenitudo, and what Dante will later call the love that moves the sun and other stars. Okay, so how do we tie these two together? For Bonaventure, the way we tie these two together is in Francis himself. Right? The figure of Francis and the concrete and the specific ways in which Francis personally existentially walks in the footsteps of Christ. Um, that walking gives him the vision, right? This personal existential embrace of the crucified gives him a vision of the cosmos that we see in the canticle of the creatures. So that sort of integration we already see in the life of Francis, right? How does that, how do we think through that? Well, love as real love is personal, it's embodied, it's carnal, it's incarnate. Francis' own conversion, he's, he, at the moment of conversion is set off by the, when he realizes that he has a distaste for beggars and he has to overcome that. And he goes and embraces a beggar, right? Uh, I mean, a, a leper. Um, and so he, he, this, this sort of affiliation with outcasts. Think of Fran Francis was fond of the big dramatic action, you know, stripping naked and throwing his clothes uh, mm -hmm. at his father, you know, all of these sorts of big dramatic actions that are all embodied and incarnate. Um, you have a kind of carnal or incarnate spirituality. What about poverty? Well, for Bonaventure, he writes a lot of, you know, he's got disputed questions of poverty. He's got a big defense of the, of the mendicants. Um, for Bonaventure, Franciscan poverty carries the weight of paradox, right? The paradox of our love for God and God's love for us, because there's a kind of metaphysical mendicancy that we have. Right? What do we have that we did not receive as creatures? If we are radically dependent on God's gracious gift, then we're all mendicant. And so to embrace the mendicant lifestyle is in a sense just to sort of own up to our universal mendicancy. But then here's the paradox. When we empty ourselves, embracing our contingency and let go of all the big and little ways we try to sort of shore ourselves up, we look around and we find that God is right there with us, that God's power such as it is, always has the shape of self-dispossessive gift. Think about Philippians 2, 4. For though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. Right. So that great sort of vision of, uh, of mendicancy, when we own up to our own creaturely mendicancy, we find that we're paradoxically an icon of the self-emptying of God in Christ. We're conformed to Christ by our own emptying. So, near the end of his life, when Francis received the stigmata, these mystical wounds that he received in his hands and in his side, um, he has this vision of the crucified seraph. And Bonaventure in his life of Francis says that, uh, that, that Francis, who had conformed his soul uh, to Christ completely, now received confirmation of that conformation uh, by being conformed in body as well. And Bonaventure's most famous work, the Itinerarium, uh, begins with the contemplation of this vision of the crucified seraph uh, that, that, that Francis has on Mount Alverno. Um, and it leads him through the Itinerarium so that when, by contemplating crucified seraph, you can see the cosmos charged with the grandeur of God, to borrow from Gerard Manley Hopkins. You can see that metaphysical love in the Dionysian vision but then you can see the existential restless heart yearning for God. And both of those are present in the itinerarium. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay, so you may ask, well, is all this necessary? I mean, this sounds really complicated, all these sources and all these different ways of thinking about things. If you have Francis, why do you need all this stuff? It can seem so abstract and so difficult. Uh, why not just follow the example of Francis? Well, interestingly, Bonaventure sort of thinks about that in the opposite way. Um, you know, Francis is a saint, 
Francis has all of this sort of uh, uh, gracious capacity to receive, right? Um, so he's got that. But most of us need a little more help with that. And so most of us need to need to learn. Most of us need to learn. Bonaventure says, the door to wisdom, if wisdom is what we want, Francis had wisdom, but if wisdom is what we want, the door to wisdom is a yearning for it and a forceful desire. That is the way wisdom comes into me, the way I go in toward wisdom. Indeed, the way wisdom and charity too enter into me, this quote from the Galatians and Exameron. But so if we, if we require this yearning, this forceful desire, is that just any desire? No, we, let, we need to desire the right things in the right way. So how do we do that? And Bonaventure says, well, you need discipline. You need to be, your desire needs to be disciplined and ordered. And he says, discipline is twofold. And he uses these terms. He says, discipline, the discipline of desire is twofold. It is scholastic and monastic or moral, he says. And the scholastic discipline is not enough without the monastic. So what is scholastic discipline? Scholastic discipline cultivates our understanding. And he says it is necessary for us to begin from understanding in order to arrive at wisdom. We need to learn to see and know the world and ourselves rightly in order to embrace wisdom. So how do we see this illustrated in the itinerarium? As I, as I mentioned, I would I'd get to. Well, he begins the itinerarium saying this is the speculation of a poor man in the desert. And the, the, the prologue to the itinerarium is shot through. You look at how many times variations on the word pax or pachum, uh, peace, appears in the, in the introduction of the itinerarium. Bonaventure is uh, overwhelmed with his work as minister general, his new job as minister general. He visits the Mount, uh, Mount Alverno uh, in order to visit the spot where, where Francis had received this vision and received the stigmata. Uh, seeking peace. And as he's contemplating that vision, he says, well, the six wings of the seraph can be rightly understood to signify the six uplifting illuminations by which the soul is disposed, as by certain steps, to pass over to peace through the ecstatic transport of Christian wisdom. So it begins in chapter one and two with uh, uh, finding the God in, in the cosmos, finding God in the vestiges in the world outside us. Then in chapters three and four, we move to recognize God, to find God in the image and likeness in the human person. So to find God within in that existential dimension there, right? So we see chapters one and two, we have the cosmological dimension. Chapters three and four, we have the, the personal, the existential dimension, the image and likeness there. Before five and six, we contemplate God and God's attributes or God's, uh, God's names would be better than attributes, beings and goodness until finally in chapter seven, we enjoy, we, we receive, we accept union with God in the embrace of the crucified. So you see that movement there along the six wings of the seraph, along the path of understanding of a transformed understanding that is able to recognize God in the world around us, to recognize God within ourselves, to see something of God in the divine names, and finally to embrace God in the crucified. So I think that's part of Bonaventure's vision from very early on, that motivation to sort of hold on to the Franciscan insights is there from the beginning of his thought. By the end of his life, I think Bonaventure begins to have some concerns. I don't think as some people do that he becomes an anti-intellectual or anti-scholastic or, right? But I do think he has some cautious words about how life in the university is going. So, how do we think about that? Well, to see and know the world rightly requires understanding and understanding is cultivated in study. And so he wants to hold on to that. He embraces that. That's his whole life. But he says study alone is not enough. So this last work, these lectures that he gives really in the year before he dies, um, the Colossians on the six days of creation is addressed to a whole community of friars, masters and students. And I think that the whole purpose of this last work is to help his students navigate life at the university. Because there are a lot, as in any university, but especially in the 1270s, 1260s and 1270s at the University of Paris, there are lots of competing ideas. And I don't have time to go into that in great detail here. But if we want to talk about that in q and I'm happy to do so. But, but 
he needs to find a way to guide his students through life and study at the university um, and still hold on to their Franciscan identity, still hold on to the fire of piety and devotion, right? Um, so, uh, so that's what I think he's trying to do in these collations on the six days. They're very scholastic. They're high powered intellectual work. They're working with Aristotle's categories. You know, I mean, they're just doing the good scholastic work, but they're framed with this always something more there. He says, passing from knowledge to wisdom is not at all assured. Something must be there to mediate between them. And that something is holiness. Right. So um, Bonaventure, I think, recognizes that scholastic reason is a technique. Jacques Maritain has a sort of throwaway line in the degrees of knowledge where he says, scholastic, scholasticism is the first technique or technology of, uh, of the Western world. Um, but and I think there's something right about that, that scholasticism is a technique or a technology that is rightly used only within a form of life ordered to holiness. And otherwise it can become deceptive and destructive. I think he's worried about that. And I think he wants to guide his students well. But <laughs> said, hey, you, hey, you, there's a tagline at the end of this because Bonaventure is called away before he can finish these lectures. He only gets just over halfway through these lectures that are trying to create this vision of the intellectual and, and spiritual life, uh, integrated intellectual and spiritual life. It gets through about a little more than half and he's called away um, because he's created Cardinal Archbishop of Albano. Uh, he's put in charge of the Second Council of Lyon to assemble in 1274. And then he presides over the first session of that council and then he dies in Lyon on July 15th in 1274. Um, Peter of Tarentes, uh, who later becomes uh, Pope, uh, preaches at his, at his uh, at funeral, uh, funeral mass, and he preaches on this beautiful passage, uh, I mourn for you, my brother Jonathan. Um, Bonaventure was very well loved. Uh, I won't sort of dwell on this. He was, uh, he was uh, entombed in Lyon Cathedral, uh, where his his relics, his remains, fell victim twice to once to the Reformation and once to the uh, to the Revolution. Um, so we only have the uh, the the relic. We only have the arm uh, of Bonaventure, the arm and hand of Bonaventure, which was sent back to Bagnoregio and, and is still there today. Um, but it's an interesting story, but maybe for another day. But a couple of images of Lyon Cathedral. Okay, so what do we do with all of this information? I wonder if we can think with Bonaventure as we confront what we might call the divisions of the secular age. Have we lost an integrated vision of a form of life? In my field in theology, we often lament that, the, that at some point in the 13th, 14th century, there seems to be a division between spirituality and theology. There seems to be the creation of this new category of mystical theology as some kind of separate thing and it's usually for the spiritually marginal, but sometimes for the spiritual elite. In either case, it's a kind of a separation. Do we deal with the professionalization of knowledge too, and especially even the knowledge of theology? Charles Taylor in The Secular Age argues that the birth of the secular has its roots all the way back into the 12th and 13th century. So if we, if we ourselves are looking to repair some of these separations, might we look to Bonaventure for help? And just as a suggestive line, Bonaventure has this great line about scripture where he says in uh, Galatians 13, the book of scripture has the power to repair the whole world for the knowledge, praise, and love of God. So as we look to repair our own world, maybe Bonaventure can be of help to us there. But how do we do that? This great passage from um, uh, if you wish to know how this can happen, ask grace, not learning, desire, not understanding, the groaning of prayer, not the diligence of reading, the bridegroom, not the teacher, God, not man, darkness, not clarity, not light, but the fire that wholly inflames and carries one into God through transporting unctions and consuming affections. God himself is this fire and his furnace is in Jerusalem. And it is Christ who enkindles it in the white flame. Enkindles in the white flame uh, and of his most burning passion. 
that's the 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 closing passage there of uh of bonaventure's uh itinerarium and uh it's striking because it comes at the end of this very very uh scholastic reading of you know of the natural world and of the soul and uh, you know all of this stuff and at the very end of that passage he says right but if you want to know how to finally embrace you need to go beyond that so this vision grace not learning desire not understanding is at the other end of this rich experience of um of understand of seeking to know that that wisdom comes at the end of reason but only through holiness and maybe that's where i'll stop thank you all for your attention it's been a great pleasure to be able to share a little bit about bonaventure with you Thank you. All right, is my is my camera coming back on? Oh, very good. Professor Hughes, thank you. This is a tremendous uh, presentation on, on Bonaventure. There's a lot of a lot of, uh, going on here. Quite a lot of uh, a lot of things touched on from his childhood, his earlier influences, his the role of Francis, and uh, this vision that that we seem to have lost. There's there are a lot of questions on on all these uh, these these topics. I think we should dive right in. Um, we, we started this webinar with uh, looking at uh, uh, Gregory the Great, especially his fourfold view of reading scripture. And we have a, a question about scripture uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, Suji, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, uh, asks, for Bonaventure in the two poles of intellectual and spiritual, where does scripture fit in? That's a really good question. Um, Scripture, so the Collations and Exameron that I was quoting from at the end there, um, has a sort of, Bonaventure likes to think about the transformation of understanding. And it begins with natural understanding, and then it goes to the understanding of faith. And then the center piece of that, uh, of that transformed understanding is the understanding of Scripture. And it's clear that's where Bonaventure wants to spend the most of his time, because it's scriptural understanding that becomes first of all, is the work, as he understands it, of theology. So he's teaching these, preaching to these students, and he wants to say, okay, how do we think about Scripture? Well, Scripture becomes the sort of locus of this kind of rich uh, soaking into uh, the divine word who is Christ. Um, and what's interesting about this uh, is that, that Bonaventure... Um, he has the traditional fourfold sense of uh, literal, allegorical, uh, moral, and, and anagogical, sort of traditional medieval tropes. Um, and he, he values that. He sort of really ex sort of digs into that and expands it. But then he also wants to go beyond it because Bonaventure is convinced with a lot of other Franciscans at the time that scripture might actually be able to tell us something about our own age. He's convinced that the tool of typology that you see in somebody like Joachim of Fiore may need to be corrected and sort of centered in Christ in a way that people were worried that maybe Joachim was saying Christ can be left behind and, and the Holy Spirit will take over. Um, but, but Bonaventure wants to embrace the sort of openness to scriptures, he says, infinite capacity, these infinite meanings, these infinite understandings that scripture can continue to deliver and even deliver about our own life, about our own practice, about uh, the, the progress of the church in, in history. Thank you. And, and it, something that you were saying sort of triggered a question in my own mind. I, I'll, I'll, quickly, I'll quickly pose it before you move to the next one. I wonder if, how, how accurate it is to say that, that Bonaventure's uh, intense contemplation of Francis might also be a way of seeing Francis as a kind of uh, living scripture, right? That Francis sort of so embodied the life of Christ and the life of the apostolic life that in a way it, he sort of is a window into what, how to understand scripture. Is that, is that also part of the, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think that, um, you know, you see in Francis himself, a desire to, you know, to walk in the footsteps of Christ to really, in a sense, perform the new Testament. Uh, in 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 the echo, right? Uh, in the imitation of, of Christ in that way, and I think that that is the sort of that is the thing that um, 
opens up this possibility. I mean, Bonaventure is convinced that something amazing happened in the life of Francis, that God is doing something remarkable in the life of Francis. And if God can work in the life of Francis in a way that changes everything as far as Bonaventure is concerned, well, then we need to be open to the ways in which God will continue to work in that way uh, beyond, you know, after Francis's death in the Franciscan community and in the whole church. Yeah. Thank you. Um, speaking now, going back to this idea of this integrated vision, which I think is, is such at the heart of it, we have a question from another person on another side. It's a little bit of a difficult question, but let's see if I can pose it effectively. Uh, James asks about whether, uh, ultimately, about whether atheists can be good scientists in Bonaventure's view. James writes, how is the monastic element integrated into seeking the truth? If that monastic element is merely an extrinsic aid, an external discipline that helps us seeking well, it seems merely instrumental. If that monastic element is intrinsic, we might wonder whether wonder that studies can be merely truthful without moral perfection. Can atheists be good scientists, perhaps? It's a really good question, and I think it, uh, it doesn't admit of a simple answer, unfortunately. Um, Bonaventure is convinced, so, so let me just sort of root this specifically in something that Bonaventure uh, says explicitly. What Bonaventure says about Aristotle, for example, Aristotle is absolutely brilliant, but it's not surprising that he would fall into certain errors, say about the eternity of the world or things like that. Um, it's not surprising that he would fall into certain errors because he didn't have the sort of fullness of the truth, right? Now, is that, no, so how do we take that? Bonaventure is convinced that if you don't know something as creature, you don't really know something. Mm -hmm. There's a great passage in the Colossians and uh, in Hexameron where he says, everybody wants to be knowledgeable and wise, but it is with us as it was with the woman. He's talking about Eve, right, in the garden. And Eve beheld the fruit, found it was beautiful and was beguiled by it. And then she fell. The, the image is like, it was the beautiful surface of the thing was beguiling for Eve and that, uh, that our knowing can fall in love with surfaces. But to really know something as what it is, is to know it as given into being, to, as, as a gift of love. So to know it as rooted in a gift mm -hmm. is part of what it means to know it fully. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that, that you know, Aristotle should have just quit while he was ahead? Not at all, right? I think he, Bonaventure, you know, is sometimes sort of given, um, uh, a hard time in a sense and by historians for being sort of fideistic or something like that. No, he thinks that there is sort of real power in Aristotle. He uses Aristotle an awful lot, but, but when he runs into these places where Aristotle disagrees with scripture, where Aristotle sort of comes into conflict, he's not surprised because he is convinced that the fullness of truth, the fullness of truth of anything is to know that it is given. <laughs> to know that it's part of this gift. To, to see in the way, I mean, in a sense, to sort of call back to Francis, to see in the way in which it sings praise and not just is. Mm. Um, so what do you do with that? Well, can you be a good scientist? Yeah, within the sort of constraints of the particular disciplines of a science, for sure. But will you ever know something fully? Bonaventure is Concerned that if you don't know uh, the thing as, you know, the, whatever you're studying, whatever your ciencia is about, if you don't know it uh, as given into being, you won't know it fully. Doesn't mean you won't know it at all, but you won't know it fully. Mm. That's, that's really helpful. And that's, that's, that's quite, yeah, that's a great answer to this really challenging question. Um, there's several more questions about this topic, but I'm wondering if we should, I wonder if we should move to, to speak about uh, some, of the, some of the things you, you uh, related to or you referred to in your, your presentation about his larger uh, 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 milieu and, and, the and the controversies in which he was swimming. Um, you, you mentioned before that uh, there's this relationship between Thomas and, uh, and, and Bonaventure, that Thomas had some of Bonaventure. Uh, we've had several questions about what kind of influence uh, Thomas may have had or received from, from Bonaventure and what, how, they, how the two 
interacted or, or might be might be understood as, as similar and different? Good. This is a question that's near and dear to me. And let me ask, answer it a little indirectly first, because it, one of the things that I think scholarship on Bonaventure has suffered from mm. is that um, very often, if you know, there are two figures in the Middle Ages or in medieval theology. There's there's Thomas and then uh, Bonaventure as the sort of foil, and often that is sort of cast in a sort of uh, you know for or against Aristotle or um, Bonaventure as the sort of last samurai defender of uh, of the Augustinian th synthesis, and here comes uh, Thomas uh, embracing Aristotle in this new way of thinking. I mean, there are various ways in which that story is told, but none of them I think are sufficient. First of all, because there were a lot more people in the Middle Ages than Thomas and Bonaventure, but also I think it tends to obscure the ways in which they they do have real differences. And, you know, as I said, one one difference I think would be the ways in which uh, in you know, in response to the last question, Thomas is quite comfortable saying, like, okay, we know what a science is, we know what it is to know within that science. Anybody could kind of do that in a certain way, right? And Bonaventure's not going to completely disagree with that, but Bonaventure's emphasis would be like, yeah, but what do you have there, right? You know, if you don't know that it's given into being by God. So they don't even necessarily disagree in the way that we typically would think they do. Right, but they disagree. They sort of shift their emphasis. They have different senses of what's most important to to lean on there. So let me say um, one last bit, and maybe maybe uh, if it's not sufficient, I can say more. If you if you let me know, I think that um, Bonaventure is writing these collations, delivering these collations at exactly the same time that Thomas is composing his Summa. I like to think that both Thomas and Bonaventure are aiming to reform, they, they have similar concerns that things are going awry in the University of Paris, mm. right? So they, have a, they, are, they are kindred spirits in a kind of critical engagement with the scholastic education that they both knew, that they both experienced, but that they both want to heal or repair. Thomas's form of repair, I think, looks like the Summa. And Bonaventure's form of repair looks like the Collations and Examera on these sort of uh, homilies or lectures. And uh, a lot could be said about, you know, what's similar and what's different there. So I think that they have more in common than we often uh, give account for, while they do really clearly have some very distinct differences um, with respect to certain ways of reading Aristotle, with, you know, uh, other concerns that they might have. But, uh, but, but I think that we often, tend to, to forget those common commonalities. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's, re that's really helpful in understanding how this works. With, with Thomas, and we had a tremendous presentation a few weeks back, we have a, a really optimistic view of how faith and reason fit together. But as I think you're pointing out so nicely here, Bonaventure is much more concerned about how the person who studies and the person who reasons might have a conflict in their soul, right? not about whether faith and reason fit together, but something like, is that, would you say that's accurate? I think that's right. I mean, I think it's very telling and I, I'm, I'm still trying to work on exactly what I think this means, but the, the works that we know by Bonaventure, like the Itinerarium, the, the Mind's Journey into God, um, like the, the, um, the Collations and Examaron I was just talking about, they tend to be structured by, uh, by the transformed subject, right? The transformed knower. And, and, you know, I, so, I, so it's really interesting to think about why that is, what Bonaventure is doing when he's saying, okay, we understand in this way, and then we are elevated in our understanding in the next way, and then, you know, this sort of stepwise progression in a deepening of our understanding. That's how he wants to structure things, whereas Thomas wants to structure things by the object of study, right? That's a sort of good Aristotelian would. What does that say? Well, again, I get, I, I'm hopeful that it clears the ground for convergence, for agreement, actually, in, in some profound ways, right? I do think that, you know, to categorize Bonaventure as a pessimist as opposed to Thomas as an optimist is just false. Mm -hmm. But Bonaventure is concerned about what happens, you know, what is the life, what is the form of life that, that holds this reasoning, that holds this faith, and how do, how do those things come together within a life? within a, a transformation of understanding. Um, 
that that's where he wants to put his emphasis. That's what he's concerned about. And that's why I think he's raising a red flag at the end of his life, because he's worried about how it's going. Uh, he's not sure it's going well. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and it's focusing on the soul. We've had another question with several questions about uh, Bonaventure on the soul on the human person, how the human person fits into this. Ramon asks, Given Bonaventure's presentation of how the soul moves towards God, as you pointed out in these steps in the itinerarium, first, what is Bonaventure's anthropological view? And secondly, how does his anthropological view harmonize with contemporary psychological thought? Are his thoughts still relevant? Can they teach us something today? Yeah, so, um, so I think that in this case, I think that, that Bonaventure's, um, his anthropology really um, is really borrowing a page as I suggested in the talk, I think, from Augustine. I think he's deeply Augustinian in this way, mm -hmm. meaning a couple of things. First of all, I think that, that uh, for Bonaventure, Bonaventure, Bonaventure is interested in desire and the way desire structures the human, human movement. Right, human movement into understanding, human movement into wisdom, human movement into a form of life, into a career, into a vocation. Right, this the sort of movement of desire, I think, is is one of the keynote dimensions uh, of uh, areas of, of focus for him. He really wants to see that, and in that, I think he shows himself to be very Augustinian. I think that lends itself very well to uh, to and maybe also sort of assists. Um, contemporary psychological uh, understandings of the human person. Because I do think that we understand, nobody's a Freudian anymore, but we do understand that there is a kind of, there is a kind of fundamental ordering of desire that sort of, that can go well or go ill for us. So Bonaventure's image is that, you know, we are, we were created upright, but we're, we're bent over in our desire. And when we're, when we're, the image that he has in the prologue of the second book of sentences is that we're sort of like, we're sort of warped out of shape where we're kind of hunched over and we can't relate rightly. When, we, when we're in that position, we can't relate rightly to the world around us. We can't relate rightly to ourselves and we can't relate rightly to God because we're sort of hunched over. And that what, in a sense, what, um, what the healing of grace does is, is it's like, I, I joke with my students, he's like the divine chiropractor, sort of, sort of gets us upright so that we're rightly ordered. And when we're rightly ordered to God, then we're rightly ordered to everything else is that in that way. So, mm -hmm. so the theological dimension obviously is something that would be a controversial claim um, in, in contemporary therapeutic circles. But nevertheless, this sort of focus on the on the transformation, elevation, and ordering of desire, I think, has a has a deep kind of uh, convergence or resonance. And and think in thinking about those that uh, th this chiropractic of desire, this this unbending of uh, through our desire, I, I was reminded also of some of the beautiful images that you that you showed us, as well as. The images that he paints for us in the minds of, uh, as we read his texts, uh, on this question of beauty and how that relates to the soul and desire. We have a question from Pirouat. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure I messed up the name. Uh, they ask, given how invested St. Bonaventure was in the theology of Pseudo Dionysius, what are his views on art, visual arts, vernacular poetry, and so on, and his views on beauty? How do his thoughts on aesthetics compare with the, those of his contemporaries at Paris? Yeah, so um, so Bonaventure's reflection on art, uh, really the best place to find that is in his, uh, he writes a book called The Reduction of the Arts to, to Theology, into Theology, um, where he sort of lays out, here are all the dimensions, here are all the sciences, all the disciplines of human knowing, and how are they all ordered finally to theology, to knowledge of God. Um, and he does talk about this as a sort of, as a kind of, you know, that, that plastic arts, mechanical arts, all of these sort of artistic forms are uh, participations in this sort of, um, in this, uh, what, this, this, well, finally participations in knowing God. So, so they have a kind of, they're ordered by other, you know, they're not all the same, but they definitely have a place within this sort of ascent to God and Bonaventure himself writes in uh, in poetic verse. He's his um, 
uh, lignum vitae, as a tree of life, as a as his uh, meditation on the life of Christ, and it's uh, it's built around a, a, a poem that he composes on the life of Christ and all these various dimensions. So Bonaventure, in his practice, illustrates. And he has the freedom because he's not he's not bound to the uh, to the the master's chair uh, after 1257. He has the freedom to to work in different kinds of writing than somebody like Thomas Aquinas, who really is teaching and teaching and teaching um, his whole career. Bonaventure can play around with the form a little bit, but because of that, we see him working uh, poetry. We we see him working uh, a kind of theopoetics, right? We see a kind of uh, a, a, a poetic mode of, of theological reflection really is sort of very much at the heart. There are uh, verse dimensions in the uh, Legenda Maior too. You know, I mean, he's constantly working back and forth. I, Bonaventure is a good, he's, he's well-trained. And I think we underestimate this sometimes because of the image we have of what scholastics are. Bonaventure is well-trained in rhetoric. So he will ornament his writing as a way of communicating to you to say, slow down, dwell here. So one of the things that's really interesting, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up, but if you read the Itinerarium, chapters one and two, where he's just talking about the, um, and even chapter three, where he's talking about the sort of natural world that we encounter and the life of the knowledge of the sciences is not ornamented at all, right? There's no sort of rhetorical flourishes. There are very few metaphors. Their scriptural imagery is not present. And then when we get to chapter four and then we have the soul restructured by grace, all of a sudden we have this rich temple metaphor that's unfolding in all of these scriptural allusions. And this is Bonaventure's sort of theopoetics, way, right? His theopoetic way of saying, hold on, something is happening here. Something has changed here. And we can feel it as we read, not just see it as the subject or the object of our reading. So, so using it deliberately, sometimes working on the intellect, sometimes working on the affect, the emotions, the, the, yeah, that is it to get across the message. It's, it's tremendous. Yeah. There's, there's several questions about apocalypticism and, and Bonaventure on revelations. Mm -hmm. Let's, oh, uh, 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 Kevin uh, write, writes, uh, in reference to our, our previous event with Professor McGinn on apocalypticism last uh, Tuesday, our webinar on Tuesday mentioned that Bonaventure was apocalyptic. Uh, how do you see apocalypticism affect his his thinking and work? Good, yeah, it's an excellent question too. I think that um, it's very clear that the the Franciscan community, generally speaking, is better disposed to the great, and really profoundly influential in all sorts of ways. But the 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 profoundly influential prophetic figure, Joachim of Fiore, right, the twelfth century monk uh, who had been a Cistercian and then forms his own community. And you know he's considered by 12th century contemporaries as a as a prophet. And they thought that he actually had a prophetic gift. Um, the Franciscans get into trouble a little bit. There's one guy in particular who writes a, a what's called the the eternal evangel, the eternal gospel, um, and uh, sort of posits that Francis is sort of like the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Not exactly that, but but you know I mean the sort of sense that that uh, the gospel is being replaced. Um, and the Franciscans are carrying forward this new moment in history, and this is the age of the Holy Spirit. Um, so when that gets condemned, that throws a little cold water on the Joachim of Fiore stuff. What I think is interesting, and that, that's actually how Bonaventure becomes Minister General, is that the guy who had preceded him in the job was a little friendly toward the guy who got condemned <laughs> and, you know, sort of gets guilt by, by association and really can't sustain his leadership role in the, in the order. Um, and that's why they uh, have a new election. He resigns and they elect Bonaventure. So what, if that's all true, which I think it is, what's interesting is that Bonaventure doesn't turn on a dime and, and start to run away from the readings of Joe of Fiore. Instead, Bonaventure is aiming, I think really, to correct our understanding of this, because I think, well, so in, in, the, in the life of Francis that he writes, Legenda Maior, um, Bonaventure says, you know, he uses the image of Francis as the angel of the sixth seal in the book of Revelation, that, 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 that Francis has arrived in history to sort of open the a seal and we're moving into a new thing. Like I said uh, during the talk, um, or maybe it's Q&A, 
Bonaventure is convinced that something powerful has happened of world historical significance um, in, in the life of Francis and in the Franciscan community that follows from it. I think he's convinced that that makes a difference and that therefore he is more friendly to thinking through these kinds of questions about Joachim Fiore, about what the future holds, about, you know, uh, is there a coming end? How soon will it come? He's open to those kinds of questions. What he wants to do is correct them and make sure that they are centered on Christ, right? That they're not thing, claiming to leave Christ behind and move into the Holy Spirit. Um, they're, that they're centered on Christ and that they hold on to the form of life of the church going forward. That we're not about to depart into a whole new age of, uh, of a, you know, freewheeling church where there's no pope or something like that, you know. So Bonaventure is concerned to sort of correct our understanding of that prophetic vision that Joachim represents rather than eliminate it. Whereas Thomas Aquinas is really, Thomas Aquinas is no great fan of this, as I'm sure you heard Bernie uh, again talk about if you were at that talk. Um, he, he, <laughs> he takes the red pencil to a lot of Joachim's writings and says we shouldn't teach this at all. Bonaventure is a lot, lot more friendly to it because he really is convinced that that things have changed. Mm. Wow, no, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, we we want to talk a little bit about uh, the the influence Bonaventure had. Uh, there's also questions that we from our attendees about why do we don't why we know so much more about Thomas Aquinas than than Bonaventure. Uh, uh, tell tell us in brief about the maybe the the reception or the larger picture of uh, Bonaventure's influence. Two parts of the story I think are really interesting. First of all, um, after the life of Bonaventure, after he dies, um, the, that division that I talked about between the sort of originalist Franciscan vision of sort of hardcore, you know, curse be Paris that has killed Arsizi and, uh, and people like Bonaventure, sort of that division becomes sharper after his death. And in retrospect, the Franciscan community sees Bonaventure as kind of a controversial figure. So there's, so there's no, you know, Thomas Aquinas is, is canonized rather quickly after his death. Bonaventure is not canonized. Bonaventure dies in 1274. I think he's canonized in 1480, 1481. So it takes a long time for that sort of sense of value of, in, uh, the, of Bonaventure's own thought even in his home community to really be absorbed and taken up. And it really doesn't really take a, uh, a life of its own until the Capuchin reform uh, in the Franciscan community. That sort of is part of the revival of interest. If you notice that a lot of the paintings that I have there are from Zubaran, who's a 17th century uh, painter. You know, we don't have any, anything close to a contemporary image of, of Bonaventure really. We have these sort of later um, images as the as the Bonaventure's sort of cult, his following sort of takes on a late life of its own. Okay, so that's the sort of ancient story, right? The medieval story about Bonaventure uh, and his reception. Um, so I like to think of it as sort of like a, the road less traveled. You know, if we, what what if Bonaventure had been received in a in a different way? The contemporary story is uh, it would take a long time to really sort of get to the ins and outs, but but. Uh, in the 19th century, the felt need for a, for a full-on Christian philosophy that can respond to what the atheist philosophy or the skeptical philosophy that's around, uh, um, that is regnant, um, gives the Catholic Church a deep interest in, in investing in the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. And because Tom, so for a couple of reasons, because Thomas is friendlier in certain ways to philosophical reflection than Bonaventure at least shows himself to be, less, less sort of worried about it. Um, and then B, because he has a lot more philosophical works available because he spends more time as a, as a lecturer, as a master than Bonaventure does. Uh, Thomas has this sort of full, th this rich philosophical um, depth that we really have to kind of read between the lines sometimes to find in Bonaventure or not. And so there's, there's good reason why the, the church kind of invests its energy and interest in, um, in, in Thomas Aquinas. And, you know, Bonaventure sort of follows along as, as like, you know, he's important too. And uh, if you, even if you read in the end of the 19th century, the critical edition of Bonaventure's works come out and all of the notes in the scolion uh, in the critical edition, 
they just seem to be insistent, like making sure that we know that Bonaventure is a good philosopher like Thomas too, right? So that sort of spirit of the age where the, the modern study of Bonaventure and Thomas are born is really characterized uh, sort of by that, by that interest in, in a Christian philosophy and Bonaventure fits less well there in a certain way. And he's always sort of fit in along with Thomas. So that's one of the reasons why we, we don't receive it. Thank you. One really quick request and then maybe a final question. Um, uh, there's been several requests about where, where we might go to read more about Bonaventure. Do you, do you have any recommended sources or books that, uh, that you, could, you could send us to? I did. In fact, I had a screen there. Let me, I, I don't know why it didn't come up, but let me see if I can uh, just throw up a couple of, um, yeah, so there, there, was, there are some ideas. I don't know why that didn't come up the last time, but um, you can get some of these great works of Bonaventure in the, the Paulist Press Classics of Western Spirituality series, which I think is still just a fantastic resource uh, to draw on. Um, has the, the mind or soul's journey into God, the tree of life and the life of Francis. It's really valuable. Then as a kind of general introduction to Bonaventure as a thinker, uh, Christopher Collins' great work, uh, Bonaventure and the Great Medieval Thinker series from Oxford University Press is a really valuable uh, resource. And then I think there's a beautiful book that just came out this year by my friend Rachel Davis that I can't help but sort of put forward there because I think uh, it just gives a really beautiful and interesting, in, um, especially given some of the questions that I've received from, from you all, um, a really interesting perspective. It's called Bonaventure the Body and the Aesthetics of Salvation. Uh, just, I think it's a really um, fascinating read and a nice introduction to some of these themes that we've talked about in Bonaventure. Mm -hmm. Those are a couple of ideas. There's a lot more out there, but those, that's a place to start. Tremendous. Maybe as a final question, right before we go, uh, because it's pertinent to our next week, uh, there's a question about Bonaventure and, and Luther and maybe alongside Eckhart with Meister Eckhart. Uh, Nindyo, whose name I'm probably butchering, asks, can you tell about bon us a little bit about Bonaventure's influence on early Protestants? Mm. Protestant reformers read uh, Bonaventure, especially Luther, since he was an Augustinian monk as well, at least. Yeah. Uh, I I've learned that Luther was profoundly influenced by Meister Eckhart's mysticism, as well as that of Bonaventure. Do you see, do you see that influence? It's difficult to trace Bonaventure's thinking among the, er the uh, early modern European reformers. I, I think it is difficult in that way. I do think that, um, you know, as I said, one of the interesting things is that, that uh, Bonaventure becomes an important figure in the Catholic Reformation movements like the, like the Capuchin reform of the Franciscan community. So it becomes a sort of source on that side of the equation. You know, there's a great story that um, that appears in uh, Eros and Agape, uh, that sort of that notorious book, um, where uh, that Luther like read the Itinerarium. He read the Mind's Journey into God. He said, "I tried it and it didn't work." So, in the sense of the, like, the, you know, which tells you something not just about Luther, but about the way the mentality about what a spiritual manual does. As a you know, Luther is sort of given it to read and reading it as a kind of how-to manual. And expecting that like it delivers the goods by the end. Well, the way to think about the mind's journey into God is more as a sort of chronicle of a of a process of transformation, not as a not as a how-to. Um, but but Luther, you know, Luther has not some not nice things to say about Bonaventure because that hierarchical ladder-like uh, progression that Bonaventure seems to sort of lay out suggests to somebody like Luther what we might call works righteousness, right? That that sort of sense of uh, do this, then do this, then do this, then get God. And uh, I don't think that's what's going on in Bonaventure, but I do think that that's the way in which um, he's, he's likely to be read by the reformers. Mm -hmm. Well, well I think that... Um, I oh, think that... <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just going to express my great gratitude and delight at, at this presentation. It's been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hughes. Thank you. Indeed, uh, Professor Hughes, on behalf of our entire viewing audience, including me and the Lumen Christi Institute, uh, thank you for a very engaging presentation. Um, it was particularly exciting because Lumen Christi is committed in our work with students in helping to present an integrated vision of the life of the mind and the life of the spirit. And in fact, last summer, we organized a monastic summit seminar uh, 
bringing university students back to the monastery to help experience this integration. Um, so we're grateful in your pointing out uh, uh, this with the model of Bonaventure. Um, if you want to help support our work in bringing together the love of learning and the desire of God, you can donate at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, and if you'd recommend this programming, we'd invite you to do so. Share it with family, share it with friends. Um, a special opportunity um, to help recommend our programming, we have an upcoming event for high school students on becoming human, evolution, science, and the soul. So if you know a high school student out there with an intellectual itch, you can help us out um, by referring our event to them. Otherwise, you can join us again next week for our penultimate presentation within this series with Bernard McGinn on Meister Eckhart. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening.